evening to you all. I've forgotten now how many years it is that I've been coming here, I guess five, four. And, huh? Five, six, seven, eight. And each time, it was a great pleasure because so many here <coughs> have been making a very serious effort to break down the barrier of language to understand this message of the infinite way. It isn't a, an easy message to understand even if English were your native language. We have many in the United States and Canada and England who find it very, very difficult to grasp the meaning of this message. And uh, breaking this barrier of the language can be even more difficult. <clears throat> Except for one thing, that if you can catch the simplicity of the message, then language is no barrier and even a very, very simple or very slight knowledge of the language will give you the entire secret. The message is difficult not because of being complex. It is difficult because of its simplicity. That is what makes the entire message of the infinite way difficult. It is its very simplicity. You see, <clears throat> it is not an involved teaching. There are not many principles or deep metaphysics to this message. On the contrary, we begin with probably the most simple thing to understand in all religion, and that is this. There must be a God experience. In other words, Religion is not of the mind, it is of the heart, it is of the soul. There are no deep principles in a true spiritual message. That is why Jesus Christ could say that we must come as little children not seeking the deep things, the mysterious things of life, but the simple things. Now, the most simple of all to understand is this, that if you knew all of the Bibles of the world, every Bible, every scripture, and if you knew all of the philosophies of the world and all of the metaphysics of the world, <laughs> it might not help you to be healed of a simple headache. It might not help you to attain one minute of peace or happiness on earth. Because there is only one lasting satisfaction in life. Without this, everything else becomes dust. Fame, wealth, society, none of these count. None of these make for happiness or for health or for contentment. 
Yes, it is wonderful to have health, and it is wonderful to have wealth, if along with those things we have this one needful thing, and that is the experience of God. To be able to go within, to go within yourself or myself, and there find the kingdom of God and experience it. Have actual communion with God. This really is worthwhile. This makes health a joyous matter. This makes wealth a joyous matter. This even makes fame a joyous matter if together with these things we have God. Not God as a word in a book. Not God as a teaching. God as an experience. And that is where this entire message of the infinite way began. To you who have not heard me before or who are not yet familiar with all of this message let me tell you that it had its beginning in just a businessman wanting to know if there wasn't something more in life than just a successful business and good times and sufficient money I was that businessman that had many things, good things, that this world has to offer, but did not have the real thing, and therefore did not have contentment, or peace, or satisfaction, or even the right sense of health. And so it was that this search led up to a date, the end of 1928, when that most longed for thing happened, a God experience, a spiritual experience. I didn't recognize it as that at first. I didn't understand it at first. I only knew that whereas before I enjoyed my business, I no longer enjoyed it. Whereas before I enjoyed the theater and the dances and the things of the world, I no longer enjoyed them. And uh, neither did they enter my mind. I didn't miss them. I didn't enjoy them. I didn't want them. But neither did I think about them. They disappeared from my experience, from my thoughts. And then the second thing that I noticed was that first a woman came to me, a businesswoman, and asked me to pray with her and told me that if I would pray with her, she could get well. And of course, I knew nothing about prayer and I didn't know how to answer her. But I did the best I could. I closed my eyes and turn to God and I received an answer the first time that I was ever aware that God spoke to men I heard a voice within me say man cannot heal and I just rested and that woman was healed and a couple of days later a man asked me if I would pray with him that he was sick and in pain I still didn't know how to pray, but I could close my eyes again and wait. While I was waiting, he said, my pain is gone. And that went on for 18 months. And at the end of the 18 months, so many people were asking for healings that I had no more time for business. And I left the business world, and I haven't been back in it since. Now, that was how I learned that it isn't what you know that makes your life healthy, wealthy, or wise. It isn't whether or not you know how to pray. It isn't whether or not you give up 
pleading with God and begin affirming. It has not to do with that at all. It has to do with whether or not we actually make contact with that spirit that is within each one of us and which is very difficult to contact, very difficult. The average person has great difficulty in attaining that ability by themselves. And if they find somebody in the relationship of practitioner or teacher who is sufficiently one with God, that one then makes it possible for thousands of others to attain their conscious union with God. At first, this was a very <clears throat> difficult situation for me because I did have that knack or gift of healing, but no understanding of how it took place. And that's very difficult when people come to you and want to know. And then, of course, I began the study of what had been discovered by others. I studied all of Mrs. Eddy's writings in Christian science. I studied many other things that are written in books. But I did not find the answer to the actual principle that was involved until more of these experiences began to come to me, these spiritual experiences. And then I learned <clears throat> what in our work in the infinite way is probably the most important part. And that is this. There is no such thing as God answering prayer in the way that men usually expect. In other words, you cannot pray to God for something and get it. Oh, there are a few experiences in life which seem to contradict that, but if you could examine each one of them, you would find that it is literally true that God does not give us the things we pray for, and God cannot. It is for this reason that James said, if you pray and do not receive your answer, it is because you pray amiss. Now let us be honest at least with each other. The world has been praying so far as recorded history is concerned for five or seven thousand years. Praying for peace on earth. And it hasn't come yet. They've been praying to God for health. It hasn't come yet. They're praying to God for happiness, for supply, for abundance. It hasn't come yet. Not as a result of prayer. Oh no, the world that is praying to God for health, for abundance, for peace on earth, I'm afraid they will go on praying for the next 10,000 years without getting any answers. Just as our ancestors have been praying these thousands of years. And uh, if you'll notice, we spend more for armament now each year than has been spent in the last 2,000 years put together. So there's been no answer for peace on earth. And I'm sure that if you would count up the amount of dollars spent on medicine each year, you would find out that more is spent for medicine and medication and hospitalization than probably was spent in 3,000 years all added up together. So you can't say that disease is lessening because of prayer. And 
if you'll just glance around the world at the poverty that's in this world, you'll acknowledge that prayer has not removed poverty from the earth. Not poverty, not disease, and not war. And those have been the three main things that people have been praying for all of these thousands of years. And the answer is, they pray amiss. Not poverty, not disease, and not war. And those have been the three main things that people have been praying for all of these thousands of years. And the answer is, they pray amiss. It doesn't mean that prayer isn't effective. Prayer is effective. But not the prayer that goes to God for anything. The effective prayer is the prayer that goes to God for God. There is one of the greatest unfoldments that, have ever, that has ever been given to this world. God has nothing to give us but himself. God has nothing to give but the gift of God. Nothing else. This teaching was given to the world by Jesus Christ. And before 300 years had passed, the world had come to a place of tearing up that teaching and throwing it out the window. He said in his teaching that we were not to pray for things. We were not to pray for what we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed. He told us we weren't to pray in words or in thoughts. And we weren't to pray in public. It's all been disregarded now for the past 1,700 years. But it still stands as he promised it would. My word shall not pass away. And if you will look into the New Testament, you will find these words. No longer shall you pray in this holy mountain, nor yet in Jerusalem. Do not pray where you can be seen of men. Pray in secret, your Father that seeth in secret will reward thee openly. How shall you pray? Not for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Why? Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Therefore, do not pray for them. Seek not for these things. What shall you seek for if you are obedient to the teaching of Jesus Christ? Seek ye the kingdom of God. That's all. Nothing else. The realm of God. The realization of God. Watch what happens in your individual life when you give up praying for health or for wealth, for clothing or for housing, for safety or for security. Watch what happens in your life when your prayer becomes First of all, the prayer of thanksgiving that there is a God and that God is closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet and that God knoweth your need before you ask and that it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Watch the miracle that takes place in your life very, very quickly not after years, not after months, after just a few days, 
when you have agreed that God is the all-knowing mind of this universe and therefore none of us can tell God anything. Watch what happens when you begin to accept God as the infinite intelligence of this universe and instead of telling God what you need or what you would like Watch the miracle when you turn to God and say, Thy will be done. Pay no attention to anything that I think I want. Pay no attention to anything that I think I would like. Thy will be done. Thou, the infinite intelligence that created this entire universe, and therefore that must have the wisdom to know all of its needs. Watch what happens in your life when you accept the fact that God is divine love. And therefore it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom if only you can bring yourself into a state of receptivity where you are willing to accept God's grace not in accord with the way you would like it not in accord with the way you think you should have it oh no relinquishing entirely your own will your own desire your own wishes and saying oh no the infinite intelligence of this universe knows. The divine love of this universe bestows. And that's enough for me. And that is why one of the greatest prayers ever voiced is thy grace is my sufficiency. No outlining of what form that grace should take. Thy grace is my sufficiency. As you study scripture in this light, you will notice that there are certain passages that you have not paid enough attention to. In quietness and in confidence shall be my strength. No asking God for anything, no affirming to God anything, just a remembering within ourselves that thy grace is my sufficiency in quietness and in confidence shall be my strength. There is another passage. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. You see how simple that is. No asking for bread or wine or water. No asking for housing or clothing or companionship. No asking for health or abundance. No asking, just thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he will give thee peace how could you have peace or rest if you didn't have health, supply, companionship, home, and all the rest of these things? You couldn't. Therefore, to have peace or to have rest is itself evidence that all these other things have been added unto us. Therefore, we don't have to ask for those added things. We have to obey the law. I will keep him in perfect peace. When you come to Jesus Christ, you have the entire miracle of right prayer in the 15th chapter of John. If you abide in the word, if you let the word abide in you, 
you will bear fruit richly. And that's the whole secret of prayer because it says if you do not abide in the word and if you do not let this word abide in you, you will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. And isn't that the whole story of the human race? Isn't that all there is to the human race? A lot of people who've been cut off from their source they're not being fed spiritually with the Christ bread, meat, wine, and water. Therefore, they're withering on the vine. They're not receiving from their source their daily bread, their daily manna. But when we as human beings return to scripture and begin to live in that sense of prayer living in this word abiding in it and letting this word abide in us then we will find that there is a flow from within, a spiritual flow, but it appears outwardly as the added things of human life. You will find that the body responds, and if it has been sick or weak or old, it changes and becomes healthy again. If we have known lack or limitation, unhappiness, separation. All of these things begin to shape up again and to be renewed. It is, as if, it is as if there were an experience of resurrection in our lives or the lost years of the locust being restored to us through what process? The process of living in the word and letting the word live in us. What word? It really doesn't make any difference what word, as long as it, as it is the truth of God, as long as it is such truth as I am the bread of life, I am the water, I have meat the world knows not of, as long as we are abiding in scriptural promises, scriptural assurances, like the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's abiding in the word. We step out of that word and become a prodigal son. The moment we say, dear God, give me something. Give me food, give me clothing, give me housing, give me companionship. Now we are completely separated from God. And that's all we have to do to become separated from God is ask for something. Or even expect something of God. For God has nothing to give but himself. God's not only his greatest gift, his only gift to us is himself. We are told in scripture that to know him aright is life eternal. That's all there is to it, to know him aright. No seeking daily bread, wine, water, housing. Just know him aright. Abide in this word. Let this word abide in you. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, none of the evils of this world will come nigh thy dwelling place. How do we abide? In the secret place of the Most High, abide in the Word, he says, and let the Word abide in us. And the Word is any of these passages of Scripture that assure us that since God is infinite intelligence and divine love, we don't have to go to God for anything. All we have to do is to go to the kingdom of God within us and realize that within me is the kingdom of God, the realm of God, 
the reign of God, the gift of God, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. When we begin to understand this, we begin to demonstrate it. We begin to bring it forth into our experience. And then, one fine day when we are sitting thus in meditation, we feel this inner presence, or we hear the word. We receive some assurance that something is taking place within us of a very unusual nature. Something that as human beings we never knew before, never experienced before. And when this begins to happen, our salvation has taken place. From then on we are renewed day by day. From then on those lost years of the locusts are restored to us. From then on, even though we have been uh, scarlet in sin, we become white as snow, pure again. And when this begins to happen, our salvation has taken place. From then on, we are renewed day by day. From then on, those lost years of the locusts are restored to us. From then on, even though we have been uh, scarlet in sin, we become white as snow, pure again. Even though we were dead, we are resurrected, raised up again into newness of life and being. All of this begins when we stop praying to God for something, anything regardless of what it may be. The very moment that we stop trying to inform God, tell God, influence God, enlighten God, and when we reverse ourselves and take an attitude of, I can of my own self do nothing, I know not how to pray. I know not how to go out or come in. I know not what to ask for. Let thy spirit bear witness with my spirit and make intercession. Speak, Lord. Thy servant hear. There is the secret of prayer. When God speaks to us, we are in prayer. When we are speaking to God, we have separated ourselves from the kingdom of God. When we address God, we are separating ourselves from God's grace. When we learn to be still, be still, be still. and let God come through, we're in prayer, we're in communion. There is a communion then. There's no communion from us to God. God needs no knowledge that we have. God needs no requests from us. And certainly God needs no demands from us. But we need receptivity to God. We need an awareness of God. We need a companionship with God. We need to hear the still small voice because scripture tells us he uttered his voice and the earth melted. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The still small voice. God isn't in the whirlwind. God isn't in our thinking. God isn't in our pleading and imploring. God isn't even in our praying and sacrificing. That's all part of Jesus' teaching. He tried his best to stop the Hebrews from sacrificing 
thinking that they were pleasing God. He tried his best to stop them from praying up to God and to sit and listen to God and go within in the silence in the inner sanctuary, not out there in that magnificent temple, in the secret place, in the inner sanctuary. Close the door where man cannot see you and tabernacle with God. Realize God, feel God within yourself. And then you'll have contact with God. And when you have contact with God, you have all there is. Can't you imagine what it's like morning, noon, and night to know that God is here closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, and that we can turn within and close the eyes and almost instantly feel a response within, an assurance within, lo, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Before Abraham was, I'm with thee. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. Fear not. If you go through the waters, you will not drown. If the flames kindle upon you, they will not burn. Fear not. I am with you. I will never leave you. As I was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. So I am with you. Well, when that begins to come into our experience, then you'll know why he said, I am the bread of life. That very I that says, I will never leave you, is also food and inspiration and the waters of life. I can give you waters that bubble up into life everlasting. I can. <coughs> that I that speaks when we have developed the listening ear, that eye that speaks when we have learned to go within in secret, in silence, and realize where God is. God is neither low here nor low there, not in holy mountains or in temples. The kingdom of God is within you. Well, you see then that none of this is difficult. It is difficult to attain. It is difficult to bring to fruition. It isn't difficult to know what the principle of life is. That's just as simple as what I have said to you. But the attaining of it is a little more difficult. And not too difficult, otherwise none of us would ever accomplish it. We accomplish it in uh, this way. First of all, we have scripture to study. Not merely to read, because it's been read in churches now ever since the book was first printed 400 years ago. And reading it out of books is of very little value. Pondering it, meditating on individual statements seeking out the hidden meaning, the inner meaning. This is really the word. This is the bread of life. Through my own experience, I learned that all of this becomes simple if we learn how to meditate. Because meditation enables us to find a quiet place. It can be in a church if there is one handy to us and it's empty enough of people or it can be in our home any place where four five six times a day we can sit down for five or six or seven minutes or three minutes will do if there isn't more available at the time and in those few minutes go within with some of these Bible passages and then sit quietly for an extra minute and then get up and go about one's work. This repeated four, five, six, seven times in a day or night in a 24-hour period will lead to the experience of thought eventually quieting down and a response coming from within. And when it does, 
that response is from God. Now, the most wonderful part of uh, all of this is this. You don't have to make your demonstration of harmony or good every day or every week or every month. You only have to make it once in your lifetime. For after you have made your contact with God, it never leaves you nor forsakes you. Then all you have to do is your daily periods of meditation for renewing this communion, renewing this conscious relationship with God. You see, it is literally true that from the beginning of time, I and my father are one. This is your relationship with God. You are one with God and you have been one with God ever since the beginning of time, before the beginning of time actually, before time began. Now, nothing has ever disturbed that relationship. You have never been able to commit a sin grave enough to separate you from God because God cannot be separated from himself God is indivisible and that's the only self there is therefore God has never been separated from itself which means from you but just as you may have some money in the bank somewhere and have forgotten it you may own a piece of property somewhere that came to you a generation ago and you may have forgotten it. So it is that through our human experience we have lost sight of our oneness with God. And there has sprung up in us not a separation from God, that cannot be. You cannot separate God from yourself any more than you can separate glass from this tumbler. Glass and this tumbler are one. You could break it in a thousand pieces, but you couldn't separate glass from tumbler. Glass and tumbler are one. And God and you are one. And God and I are one. And nothing can break that relationship. But we can, as we have as human beings, they call it in scripture either the prodigal son experience or the Adam and Eve experience makes no difference which uh, symbol you use. It means a sense of separation sprung up in your consciousness. And whereas before you were in the Garden of Eden, one with God, heir, joint heir to all the heavenly riches, in the next breath, through a sense of separation which you entertain, you are now outside of Eden and you earn your living by the sweat of your brow. That's all that has happened to us that's made us humans. A sense of separation has sprung up in our consciousness. Now, through our return to the spiritual path, we are breaking down that sense of separation and coming into a conscious union with God. We are at one with God, but now we are coming consciously into the realization of that oneness and that is abiding in the word and letting the word abide in us when we are one with the word we are one with God when we are one with God we are one with the word and uh, to be one we must be consciously one now ye must know the truth ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and the truth that you must know is your oneness with God. You must know the nature of God. To know him aright is life eternal. And so when you begin to know God is the infinite intelligence of this universe. Therefore, I cannot tell God anything, but I can surely learn from God. God is the divine love of this universe. I need not ask God for anything. I need only accept God. And in accepting God, all these 
what we call things are added unto us. From the moment that this experience comes to us and within ourselves we feel this presence or power or assurance, from that moment on, our task in life is merely to return to that meditation day after day after day for a little inner communion with God to receive assurance and reassurance of that presence, to live, move, and have our being as if we were dependent on no man whose breath is in his nostril. Until we can obey scripture, cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostril, for wherein is he to be accounted of. Put not your faith in princes. When this experience comes to you, you can see quickly, well, I don't need man, I don't need woman, I don't need anything or anybody. I can associate with men and women, I can share with them, giving and taking, but I don't need them. The kingdom of God is within me. I and my Father are one. All that the Father hath is mine son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. Then there's no more seeking from each other, there is only a desire to share with each other. Then you, you want to go out and shout from the housetops what you've learned, and you want to give everybody in the world the feeling of God's presence. And never again do you look to them for anything, except love to share with each other, that's all. The Father hath, is mine son, thou art ever with me, all that I have is thine. Then there's no more seeking from each other, there is only a desire to share with each other. Then you, you want to go out and shout from the housetops what you've learned, and you want to give everybody in the world the feeling of God's presence. And never again do you look to them for anything, except love to share with each other, that's all. The secret of life is a simple one. To know him aright is life eternal. To acknowledge him in all thy ways is to experience harmony. To keep the mind stayed on God. To realize that we have no needs. Thy grace is my sufficiency. All of these things enables us to understand probably one of the greatest statements that ever came from the mouth of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so every time then that you're tempted to pray for food or clothing or housing or companionship, it's so simple to say, oh, but man shall not live by those things, so why waste time praying for them? The things we live by, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That doesn't mean uh, any word that proceeds out of my mouth. That doesn't mean any words that proceed out of your mouth. That means every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and is heard in your ear. Every impartation that comes from God to you, every impulse, every awareness of God that takes place within you. That's the word of God. And when he utters his voice in you, the whole earth of error will melt. Any phase of it, any form of it, and it makes no difference how many years it's been in existence. Even all the years of the locusts, even that will be overcome. Even the dead shall rise again, no matter how long they've been dead. For the word of God is life eternal. Our function in life is not to pray up to God, but to sit within and let God pray or utter its word within us. Receptivity. Receptivity is the greatest word in our language. Listening for that still small voice. Listening. Be still, be still. 
Don't say and don't think. Just be still. And then a voice will utter itself within us and it'll say, turn to the right or turn to the left or go forward. And when it does, we will obey it. Keeping the mind filled with spiritual truth is, in the last analysis, the secret of our demonstration. Keeping the mind so filled that uh, eventually we make an inner contact that frees us from the things of this world and we enter the new dimension. Those of you who do not know our work, let me tell you please that we do not have any organization. We do not have any memberships anywhere on the face of the globe, and we never will have. There are my writings, which are in book form, and there is my class and lecture work, all of which is recorded. And as quickly as I give a class or a lecture in any part of the world, those tapes go all over the rest of the world. And students from one end to the other, students in Africa are listening to classes that took place in England. Students in Australia are listening to classes that took place in New York, and so forth and so on. All around this globe, students are listening to the classwork and the lecture work and even the private work that I give. And uh, they find their inspiration, they find their practice through what they learn in the books and in the recordings. And then I have a monthly letter. And that monthly letter is my direct contact with every student. In that monthly letter, there are principles each month for practice, for remembrance, and then there is also the story of the work as it's going on around the world and as I travel. I know some of you, many of you know already that almost every year I manage to circle the globe in one direction or another. This year, 53,000 miles, something over twice around the globe. Other years have been over 50,000 miles too. And. Uh, in that way, a contact is maintained with the students, and these lessons, lectures, and uh, that enables the student to use whatever my experience is worth for their guidance and for their inspiration, and then uh, set them free to find the kingdom of God within themselves. For there are no ties, there are no bonds, there are no memberships and no dues. Nothing, every individual is free. Every individual has his own copy of the Old Testament or the New Testament. Each one may go to the kingdom of God within themselves in their own home, or if they like, they can go to a church of any denomination that suits their pleasure, or of none. We hold no one in any sense of limitation. Here is the word as it has been given to me from scripture and from the direct source of inspiration, the many, many spiritual experiences that come to me every week of the year. And they're yours. Those of you who feel a response, they're for you. Those who do not feel a response, they're not for you. That means if you haven't felt a response, that somewhere else is your teacher and your teaching. Keep seeking until you find it. When you have found it, your teaching, forsake all others. And rest with that one that is to become your meat, and your wine, your inspiration, your salvation. In that way, then, you are free to seek and find the realization of God within your own being. 
And so it is, and so it is. If there are those of you who are not receiving my monthly letter and would like it, I know that if you leave your name and address here before you go, that uh, word will be sent to England. This letter is published in the United States and in England. It's the same letter, but printed in both countries so that we reach one half of the world over there and the other half of the world over here. And that's all I can tell you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Until we meet again.